Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Andres Martinez. I'm a vice president and editorial director here at the New America Foundation. Thank you for joining us for what <clears throat> turns out to be an, an even timelier discussion than we had anticipated when we scheduled this, given the week ahead here in Washington on immigration reform. Um, to my left is Simon Rosenberg, the president of NDN. And to my right is Tamar Jacoby, um, who is a fellow here at the New America Foundation, in addition to being the president of Immigration Works, um, uh, who we've partnered up with to do this event. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Tamar. Um, both, as you know, uh, both these individuals have storied longer biographies. But just to keep things rolling, I'm going to leave it at that. Other than to say that, uh, to add that there are fewer people. There, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, two other people in town who have as active and engaged uh, an experience with immigration reform in Washington, and who have been more influential. Uh, both in this round of immigration reform, but also previous rounds. Um, so we have uh, battle-tested uh, immigration <laughs> scarred, reform scarred. experts. Uh, not quite scarred. <laughs> mm. um, and our, our premise here today is uh, immigration reform has shown a great deal of uh, traction this year. Um, we hear a lot about how Washington is broken. Uh, there's excessive polarization. Nothing gets done. That's kind of been the working narrative now for, for quite some time about our political process. And yet, we've seen this year uh, great progress on one of the more uh, intractable, difficult issues of recent years, immigration. So who knew? Um, and in fact, a lot of the conversations that I've been around on the, the political climate in Washington generally always point to immigration as the one kind of sunny exception to a lot of the gridlock that's, that's occurred in DC. Um, and one thing that I worry about is that that might be uh, too optimistic and a, or maybe too prematurely optimistic because as these two individuals know better than, than, than most of us, uh, it's not quite done yet. Uh, we've seen a very ambitious uh, bill that was put together by this gang of eight in the Senate, uh, voted out of committee, so we have an ambitious what we can call comprehensive immigration reform underway. And this week, it's going to the floor of the Senate. And then the House will weigh in at some point. So uh, some of us have seen this movie before in <laughs> 2006, 2007. So it's, uh, I'm a little skittish to, to declare victory. Um, so we shall see. But it is true that we've seen improbable you know, success so far, or progress, I should say. Um, so one thing you know, I'd like to start us off with is uh, and maybe Simon, you can get us started, is to step back and talk a little bit about, um, you know, so far what we've seen in the Senate, uh, how optimist, how comfortable are you with the parameters of what this immigration reform looks like now? Is this something that you're ecstatic about? Um, and then I'll ask you tomorrow that as well. And then since you're playing the role of, of democratic advocate for immigration, and you're playing the role of Republican advocate tomorrow for immigration. Then I want each of you to talk about uh, the potential pitfalls and obstacles that the other side might throw up to really uh, play to form and, and have this, at the end of the day, be another instance of, of gridlock and dysfunction in Washington. And then we'll reverse roles, and each of you can concede what your own side might have to compromise on to really get us to the, to the promised land. So Simon, just in terms of what the legislation looks like now, how are you feeling about it? So optimism first and then poison pill second. Exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and then a happy ending. <laughs> and then a happy ending, right. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. It's great to be here. And it's always good to be up here with Tamar, who I've learned a lot from uh, and uh, who I think has really done a, I think she's had a harder job than I have uh, over the last uh, eight years, which is keeping the, the fire burning on the Republican side. And it's always, you know, I have incredible admiration for the New America Foundation, so it's great to be here as well. Look, I, I you know, I have to say that um, if you, if we go back to when these Gang of Eight negotiations began, um, there wasn't a lot of reason to be optimistic. Um, you know, this is an issue that's been brought up, as you pointed out, we made, you know, we did pass this through a, a Republican Senate in 2006, McCain and Kennedy leading the way, 
where there was a lot of, and then the House wouldn't take it up. In 2007, even though the Democrats had won the Senate, there was a lot of optimism, and then for reasons we could spend the rest of the program probably talking about it didn't pass. And so I just think there was caution, cautiously optimistic. Um, we were cautiously optimistic, and the Gang of Eight was a new group, right? There were new people involved, and this was untested, and, and uh, I think it's really worked. I mean, I think that even though there are things, and I'm sure tomorrow will say the same thing, is that there are things that are in the immigration bill that I don't like, I feel like all the compromises that we saw were understandable. I could explain them. You know, I, I, I didn't feel like the Democrats accepted things that they didn't get something in return for. And I think this was in some ways, you know, I think this goes back to the origin of this bill. McCain Kennedy, when they built this bill in 2005, did so uh, in a very old-fashioned way, which is they, everybody got something, everybody gave something, and there was a powerful coalition behind it that was going to see the, the bill through. I think that spirit prevailed in, this, in these negotiations. And obviously, as a Democrat, I think you know, we would have liked the path to citizenship to have been a little bit less arduous. And um, you know, there is probably the main complaint that you'll hear from, from Democrats. But you know, this bill, getting back to what you said, this is an ambitious bill. It does an awful lot. I mean, this is a, you know, in a time where I think partisanship has sort of diminished the legislative ambition of a lot of legislators in Washington. This is a, a, an antidote to that, right? I mean, it deals with border security. It deals with significant infrastructure investment along the border that's going to continue to create jobs and, 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 and both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. It deals with a reorienting of the legal immigration system so it's more skill-based. It deals with, obviously, the undocumented uh, in a way that I think, the undocumented immigrants in the country, I think, in a way that is at the end of the day, I'll take it. It may not have been how I would have done it, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and it also, um, you know, and I think those are the major components of it. Right. So optimism, happiness can explain the compromises. And I think it's one of the reasons you've seen Democrats really standing up and fighting for this. Tamar, your initial Yeah, so overview. I mean, my overview is also positive. Yeah, well, also, thank you for being here. It's great to be at New America, and it's great to be on stage with Simon. Um, also very astonished at really at how much progress they made and how, in the big view, how good a product it is. Obviously, I have concerns about it. We can get into the weeds about the concerns. But you know, it's remarkable the bipartisan work they've done. A year ago, to say that Republicans would have been full partners in an immigration, comprehensive immigration reform bill, I mean, people would have laughed if I'd said that you know, on a panel like this. And that they were at the table and they w were full partners and that the two sides really worked together so effectively to try to find the sweet spots. And you know, I kind of, I think all of us in Washington think that they've kind of lost those muscles, you know, that people don't know how to b do bipartisan compromise anymore. And so what's astonishing is to find out, well, you put eight guys in a room with the will, and they do still have. Once you have the will, people do still know how to negotiate and how to get to a deal. And I think they did that not just on the big things, because obviously at some big level, this is a grand bargain between people who want an answer for the 11 million unauthorized and people who want more enforcement and make sure it doesn't happen again. They made that big bargain, but they also made a lot of, on every page there's a bargain. You know, This comes down to every little detail has to be worked out so it works for Republicans and it works for Democrats, and it actually works on the ground. And I think they did quite an amazing job of getting a lot of those things right. They looked for those sweet spots and they found them. And you know, the biggest one is, again, a, a humane and practical answer for the 11 million unauthorized, combined with a pretty serious determination to get enforcement on the border and in the workplace. I mean, we're, they're going to spend you know, up to $5 billion on the border. And every company in America is going to have to use E-Verify to make sure that the, the people it hires are work authorized, according to the, to the Social Security Administration and the, and the immigration service. That's a big, those are big enforcement pieces. And the other, you know, big deal here, the big compromise, is that they really rebalanced our immigration system. Right now, 66% of the green cards, of the permanent visas we give out every year, go to family. And 7% go to employment-based, people we, people we need to work here, 7%. And you know, that's way out of sync with other countries. You know, Canada, it's 25% go to employment-based. Australia, it's 40. The UK and Germany, it's 60. And we're still stuck at 7. So the idea here is a rebalancing. You talked about skilled people, but it's rebalancing in general. Workers we need for the US economy, what's in our interest, um, and a rebalancing with family. Where do you see that 7% ending up? 
Yeah, or is it too hard it's to gonna, tell? It's going to be hard to predict because it's going to depend on the economy and how many people apply. But we could get to something like 60-40. So 60 family, 40 employment base. And some people say way down, you know, down the road. It can even get closer to 50-50. Right. So important rebalancing. And that was bipartisan agreement on that. You know, that's what's remarkable. I mean, I think Republicans might have been asking that for a long time, or maybe some Democrats. But important bipartisan agreement. And you know, I think, this, as Simon alluded to, the, the answer for the 11 million unauthorized immigrants is there is an answer. It's tough. It's not an automatic or special path to citizenship. That's important to Republicans. But there's a path. So you know, try to find the sweet spot. Um, you know, um, uh, um, concerns you know, on my side. I mean, obviously, um, we're going to see a fight playing out in the Senate in the weeks ahead over, are the border triggers tough enough? You know, that, right. that, that it, has this, it has these provisions that say people can't get to be citizens until the border is secure, and E-Verify, every, every company is using E-Verify. But there are a lot Republican offices, many Republican offices, I would say, who think that it's not really a meaningful trigger. That, you know, they're sort of put there on the same paragraph, but it's not really a trigger. And I think we're going to see some, you're going to see a lot of debate around that. Um, you know, my other. And there's some amendments. And that there are amendments on that are going to, yeah. Unless you arrest 101% of people trying to cross, nobody gets citizenship. Well, <laughs> it's, I mean, the key point in there. That might not be verbatim. I mean, right. And we're going to get to this right about. Right. But I mean, the key point there to continue the bipartisan compromise is that for Republicans have to have meaningful and meetable, right. meetable requests and can the Democrats meet them you know it doesn't work if the Republicans ask for something that's impossible you know full okay but but bigger picture you both are are very appreciative of the compromises that have been made and, and I should say you both have played a role in, in making that so um, but let's interrupt the sort of kumbaya vibe for a minute <laughs> and then we can come back to it at the end now uh, Tamar uh, tell us uh, what are some of your concerns of what his team might do in the next few weeks, months, both in the Senate, but particularly when we get into the House, um, that could lead us, you know, they could get us off track and we'll be here in the fall bemoaning the fact that immigration is just another in the long list of things that Congress can't, can't handle because of partisanship. Right. So, so I'm not going to accuse any individuals, right, of doing anything. But <laughs> just if I was imagining just the, the mindset of the Democrat, right, if I was a Democrat and I was looking at this, I would say, you know, we won the election with Seven, was it 71 to 27 percent of Latino votes? And you know, as a political football score goes, that's a pretty good score, right? Like, why would you want to change that? It's pretty, you know, parties work hard to get scores like that, 71, 29. Why would you want to change that? Why would you pass a bill with which you have to share credit with the other party and go back to Latinos and say, well, you don't have to hate Republicans anymore. They joined us in passing immigration reform. So just you know, without knowing wow, anything you, you, that anyone you'd be has a ever very done, cynical Democrat. <laughs> that's just you know, in the back, in a, in the, in a, the, it's not hard to imagine that there's some people out there thinking like that. So the question is, who you know, will will they prevail? And there'll be lots of opportunities where things will be going badly. You know, will be go, be a little rough in the negotiating room, where it'll be really easy to say. Let's not compromise on that, and let's make it look like it was the Republicans, and it'll all fail, and we'll say we tried. But so what are some of those well, specific Well, OK, so, so. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, so for example, there's a lot of talk about should the House vote on the Senate bill? And there's a lot of hope among Democrats, and you hear advocates and immigration reform groups saying, you know, yes, the Senate bill is a good compromise. We, the House should vote on it. Well, the House will not and cannot and w w ever in a million years vote on the Senate bill. Um, the House will want to come up with its own product. If the House was forced to vote on the Senate bill, the answer would be no, and we would, there would be no reform. So, you know, people who are saying House must vote on the Senate bill and people who continue to say that, that will, that is, you know, in my view, just a non-starter. Republican members, you know, this is, and to a lot of Republican members, this is the liberal AFL, you know, we think it's balanced. But to a hardcore Republicans, think of this as the liberal, Democrat-driven AFL, you know, AFL fingerprints all over it, um, Democratic bill. Um, that's not what they want. And even if it was almost good, they're not going to want to take up the Senate, you know, something that comes out of the Democratic Senate. So that's going to be one big issue. And um, there's been a lot of talk in recent weeks about there's a bipartisan group in the House um, working to craft um, they, they, the, their own bipartisan answer that should, they hope will be sort of parallel to the Senate bill. And there's a lot of talk that it's, that it's been Democrats who've made it difficult for that group to get to a solution. 
um, that they haven't been as forthright and compromising as some of the process in the House. Now, I'm not in the room. That's talk. Maybe it's not true. I hope it's not true. But there's been talk that it's been hard to get to a, a, a compromise there because so, there are some folks who want the House to have to take up the Senate bill. So that all sounds like procedural stuff, but you know the issues. But on, on issues, I mean, yeah. what what do you think are would be kind of unreasonable asks on the part of Democrats that you know would would derail this and and would would be kind of beyond the pale in terms of what you've conce consider the sort of parameters of what's doable? Yeah. Is it is it health care subsidies? Is it uh, a pathway to citizenship that's, you know, five years or, I, I don't know. What, what, yeah, what so the House do? is going to, it's not, the, I think the Senate bill, again, I think they're going to be Republicans in the Senate who want the border security triggers to be tougher. That's going to be the biggest fight there. Right. When you get to the House, there's going to be an effort to, there's going to be movement to the right. And so the House is going to try for something, you know, shaved back. Um, and I think the issues where they're going to be issues are is going to be the path to the, the legalization for the unauthorized. I don't know if the House can go as far as the Senate has gone. And then the question is, can the Democrats accept that? Um, I think the health care and other costs is going to be a huge debate. And that's already been the debate, the issue that's kept this um, secret group in the House that's coming up with their bipartisan legislation. That's where they've been hung up for the last month. They have a deal now, but that is the costs are going to be a big issue. Health care, but not only health care. And frankly, the size of the low skilled guest worker program is going to be an issue. Um, um, uh, I and many Republicans think that the low skilled worker guest worker program in the Senate bill is a good design, but it's much too small to divert and re-channel illegal immigration. Right. So, so Republicans in the House, I think, who are concerned about we don't want to be here again in 10 years facing another unauthorized population of 11 million are going to say maybe that program needs to be a little more responsive to market needs. And can the Senate go along with that? The AFL is very adamant about, or can Democrats go along with that? The AFL is very adamant that that program not get bigger. And so can any, uh, or not get more market sensitive, can Democrats give it all on that. Right. So Simon, Simon, I'm sure Tamar was not referring to you when <laughs> she was talking about uh, the danger of some cynical Democrats looking at the scoreboard and saying, hey, why don't we just preserve this, this lead um, and not in endanger it by having, allowing the Republicans to seem uh, constructive on the immigration issue. Um, you weren't, right? No, <laughs> <I'm just laughs> wouldn't be here. But 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 those but those talk people, but talk people. a little bit about you know from your perspective, what are some of the stumbling blocks that Republicans sure might might be throwing up that that might cause us to get derailed? Well, I, I think and just listening to both of you, I, I sort of thought about this in a in a new way, which is that you know Democrats have basically signed on to the Senate bill, um, not in the House yet, and we'll see what comes out of the House process this week. But if you think about the Senate. There's no effort to drag this to the left, right? I mean, we've sort of accepted, we're happy with the bill. It went through committee. We actually picked up Republican support in the committee process, 13 to 5 vote, kind of an extraordinary. Right. I don't think anybody could have predicted that, frankly, and guys like Orrin Hatch signed on as we, we went along. And so there isn't, even though as we game this out, there's this other body that's about to weigh in that is in all likelihood going to attempt to move the bill significantly to the right. There's no parallel effort to move the bill to the left. I mean, Democrats are basically accepting what we have, which, which in itself creates a little bit of a precarious situation in the way Washington works, because in theory, if you, in any negotiation, if one side gets more, the other side has to get something. And structurally, that's not the way this is being set up right now, right? The second thing, so first of all, I think the House Republicans have an enormous decision to make, because I, I believe they will pass a series of smaller uh, things that will not be the Senate bill. And the question is, how far do they go? I mean, do they try to make this something that can be reconciled in a normal conference committee in the fall? Or are they going to stake out such difficult ground that it's going to be impossible for um, some of their members to come back and accept the ultimate compromise? Now, the truth is, out of the conference committee, we may only need 20 or 30 Republicans. And so we could have a situation where, you know, there is a, a bill that passes with 100 Republicans in the House. It goes into conference, and only 20 can accept the final product, but the bill 2025, but the, still, the bill still passes. And so how much of an obstacle that is, we don't really know. But I will say that, for example, the bill that Goodlatte and Gowdy uh, introduced last week on interior enforcement is an example of something that may, that goes so far that it's hard to understand how the Republicans come back 
from it because it includes things like providing uh, ar weapons for ICE agents and body armor, mandatory body armor for ICE agents. It's sounding like they're going to go in and commit extraordinary acts of violence against undocumented immigrants. It's sort of an extraordinary, it's one of the wackiest moments I think we've had in this whole immigration debate. Two other quick things is, I think stumbling blocks is the border triggers are a real issue. I mean, look, I think the Republicans have a legitimate concern about the border. I, I don't think the idea that 700,000 people can just walk across any border of any country whenever they want is something that any country can accept. We have to do a better job at, enfor you know, at policing our very porous and long and difficult border with Mexico, but in a way that makes sense. Uh, and, and I think that you know, there is a lot of effort led by, for example, Cornyn to toughen up on the triggers. I think the Democrats have said no. I mean, the House, uh, I mean, the Senate gang of eight have said no to any re-altering of the trigger mechanism that was negotiated. But the third thing, and I think this may get a little bit complicated down the line, is that the House Republicans have said no new spending, no net, net new spending on this. The Cornyn Amendment, if it was passed, would cost, I mean, right now the Senate immigration bill, let's just game it out, is a $100 billion bill over you know, over five years, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be 10, 15, 20 billion dollars a year of new spending in order to achieve the very ambitious enforcement goals and everything else. I don't know how we're going to reconcile, and the Cornyn bill called for a billion dollars a year of border infrastructure investment and 10,000 new border guards, right? And blah, 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 blah. I mean, the Cornyn bill alone was 50, 60, 70 billion dollars over a certain period of time. The issue of whether or not the House Republicans are ever going to accept a bill that has net new spending in it, I think is something that may be a bigger issue in the fall. But they have been very aggressive about that. And certainly the Senate bill is going to be expensive because it's ambitious. I mean, what's interesting is you take a guy like Cornyn, who's a classic conservative, right? The amendment he's floating around this week is an affirmation of the positive role that government can play in the life of the nation. It's giving government a lot more money to achieve important societal ends. Um, and can the House Republicans accept that as part of this whole thing? That worries me maybe in the fall, not, not in the next couple of months. So, so just to come back a little bit, um, on the, you know, on the asymm what, this asymmetry that you describe, which is asymmetry where R's are pulling it to the right and no D's are trying to pull it to the left, just a, a few facts. I mean, the, uh, the UAFA amendment, the gay and lesbian amendment, certainly would have, that did not get voted on, but certainly was much discussed, which, pulled, what, which yeah. was much discussed, yeah. would have taken it way to the left in a way that Republicans could not be for it. Right. Um, and there were a lot of people in the committee, a lot of Democrats in the Judiciary Committee, who when, when some of these late, very fine points of labor business balance came up, say they would vote for it, but with an asterisk was the phrase used in committee, meaning, you know, I may live to fight this another day on the floor, where I try to push it more in a labor direction. So it's not as if, the, I mean, both, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, not, I'm not praising either aren't, side. Aren't the dynamics, uh, as Simon described them, correct in that you, we've, we've started the conversation by saying, here's this artful compromise that's been achieved in the Senate, and now, but now we have to have a compromise between this bipartisan compromise here and a Republican Majority. Yeah, well, I would, uh, but I would argue that that artful that, compromise that's not is symmetrical. Ar but I would argue that the original proposal is not entirely symmetrical, right? I mean, I would argue that this was. So you're Democrats saying you're Senate. saying we should think of it's more it's it's fair to think of the Senate bill, not as a bipartisan it's a, bill. It's, it's, it's a democratic no, bill. No, no, it's, it's a bipartisan bill, but it's a bipartisan bill. A little bit on this, you know, leaning toward this, toward one side, of, toward Simon's side of the fence, <laughs> um, and you know that, and that was because, I mean, again, on the let's look at just the um, less skilled worker visa program. You know, the AFL was always saying, and this was true on the, some of the high skilled visa issues as well. The AFL has always said, if we're not happy, we'll walk. And, the, and this will, if the AFL walks, this will not get enough Democrat votes. And that was always the sword hanging over the negotiations. And so I think the less skilled visa program is a good program, but the AFL had a veto on, this, on how market sensitive it would be. And so it's a good bill. It's on the fence. It's close to the center. It's a good compromise, but it, it's, it leans a little bit toward, I won't say Simon, <laughs> but it leans a little bit toward some other people on, the other, on that side of the table. And on the border triggers as well. I think, you know, if you, if you I mean, so maybe describe a little bit for those of, of us who are not as, as steeped in the detail of this. Like, what do we, I think I know what we mean when we talk about a trigger. Well, so for example, it. so yeah. for example, I mean, the, 
the, in the original legislation, this has been fixed now, but in the original legislation, they, um, they had certain requirements had to happen, and Simon should probably do the details, he's better than me on this, but um, um, th there were certain requirements to be met on the border, and it was only to be met in three of nine districts. Um, on the border. So like why would you have these requirements and say these requirements have to be met but only in three out of nine districts? That's not exactly, I mean that's, that doesn't pass the laugh test. I mean they were the three busiest districts and most trafficked ones but I mean why just, you know, for the sake of like, like uh, humor us, like pretend you're going to secure the whole border, not three of nine districts. But is um, it well, go ahead. <laughs> so the trigger. So, I mean, again, Simon is a little more well, Really clear. quickly, the triggers that are in the current Senate bill are there are metrics that have to be met for um, both monitoring the border and the people coming across and then the number of apprehensions now across the entire border. That was one of the things that was changed. The second thing is that, and these are kicking at different points, but E-Verify, which is the, a new and you know wildly ambitious effort to create a legitimate worker verification system um, is going to be, nat you know, has to go national. Um, the third thing, Christian, what am I forgetting? Well, there but was, I mean, yeah. for part of it, so, yeah. you know, in the beginning. Those are the two main okay, but be before what? But, but before, before okay. this is the trigger well, this is the before anybody can well, be legalized? Well, before you can be legalized, the, go the government has to have a plan. Well, to a lot of Republicans, right. the government having a plan doesn't sound very interesting. Um, and then for people to get citizenship, certain things have to well, happen. Well, there's green card status and then citizenship, right? So the, the key thing is that what happened is, and this was the, and listen, the Demo this was a, what you're describing in this, we're getting into the weeds here, but this was the huge thing that Democrats gave up, right? Democrats got stuff out of the negotiations, but we, the Democrats accepted something that for many people in the Democratic family was an unacceptable compromise, which was to condition um, the citizenship path to a series of metrics that historically these things had never been connected before in any of the negotiations going back to the beginning of McCain-Kennedy. And what it meant was then the whole thing for Democrats became are the metrics that have to be met reasonable and will the government have the resources because right. these are expensive things nationalizing e-verify is a major undertaking right will they have the resources to meet these triggers in the period of time prescribed so that you don't have another condition because if the thing if one of the things we're trying to solve with this bill is having a group a huge number of people who live and work here and pay taxes here be in this netherworld of status right where they're neither you know, they're neither here nor are they, you know, foreigners. They're in this in-between place, which seems to be deeply inconsistent with American values about how we treat everybody. We're not, if the triggers are too hard to right. achieve, we're not actually solving that problem. Right? And I also feel, and doesn't it, it, I mean, yeah. I have to say the one thing that, that strikes me is a bit, um, you're not supposed to take sides. <laughs> I'm not, well, <laughs> uh, an observation. <laughs> mm. I feel like in the, in the last few years, there, have been, there has been a lot done yes. to make the borders a lot more secure. And I think one of the fallacies of the, of the political debate is it presupposes that nothing has been done since 2006 and 2007, yeah. Tomorrow, either I, on I reform. But let me just articulate the Republican concern, and, and let me articulate right. the Republican concern. Respond, right. But what people are afraid of is that in 1986, we legalized two million people, and we what? That was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. We legalized a, a lot of people, and we said there's going to be enforcement, and then no enforcement happened. Right. And the and for years, I mean, there was a year when um, three notices got sent out to employers who were supposedly hiring fraudulent well, workers. Well, and it was also like said that, that we were going to enforce it at the workplace. At the workplace, and, and a lot didn't happen. So people are very skeptical. They say, well, we're going to give you the candy, but we're not going to get the price. And so a lot of Republicans are just skeptical about that and want to make sure that there really is real enforcement. And I dare say, you know, it's, it's not necessarily anti-immigrant, right? I mean, from my point of view, I don't want to see a situation where we have more illegal, I want to convert from an illegal immigration system to a legal immigration it's not, system. My, my, my quibble isn't whether it's anti-immigrant or not. It's whether it's accurate or not. Because I think the way a lot of senators talk about the porous border you would think it's as porous as it was in 1986, and, and it's and it's clearly well, fair not. Fair enough. But what we people are asking right. is just legitimate right. measure, meetable measure that is actually real and is not there. You know, people are skeptical that we're going to have the person in charge of it, the Department of the Secretary of certified, of, uh, certify right. that it's done. Right? They just right. want okay. some okay. measure. So, in a, in a report that we released recently, which you can find on our website at ndn.org, um, we addressed this issue that you're raising, which is what's changed since we began this process since 2005. 
And let me throw out a few statistics, right, because it's kind of amazing, right? Since 2005, now, violent crime, for example, on the U.S. side of the border, you take the two biggest cities on the U.S. side of the border, El Paso and San Diego, violent crime is one-third the rate that it was a decade ago. If you look at the total number of aggregating every border community on the U.S. side of the border, the, there were 19,000 violent crimes in 2004. There were 14,000 violent crimes in those same communities a year ago. So this notion that has been promulgated by many that the border region on the U.S. side is this wild west, it's out of control, it's a violent place, not true. There's been virtually no spillover violence uh, from, from Mexico. And in fact, this has been a sign of DHS doing a really good job, right, working with local law enforcement to take what was a precarious and difficult situation and make it significantly better. We also know that net migration of undocumented immigrants went from five, 600,000 a year in the heyday of, of the unauthorized immigration to now zero, right? The third thing we know is that while those two enforcement goals were achieved, which were significant and, and meaningful, and to me, I think the only reason in some levels that we actually are able to have this debate is that those things were actually executed successfully by the Obama administration, right? And a Democrat using the enforcement regime to actually make things better. Trade with Mexico has exploded. I mean, you know this better than anybody. By the end of this year, We'll have gone from $300 billion a year in trade with Mexico in 2009 to almost $600 billion by the end of 2013 on an annualized basis. That's a doubling of trade. So we've not only had a significant gains in enforcement, we've had incredible explosion of trade. I mean, this has been, I said this to the president myself when I met with him recently. I said, look, you've this has been a wildly successful part of your administration. You've incredible domestic politics, huge violence in Mexico, yet trade is exploding. We're making the U.S. side much better. Take credit for it, right? And I do think that it's been a mistake by our side that we haven't leaned into the border success because I think it's allowed the Republicans to get away with an exaggeration of what is actually the state of play today. And I think that's ended up affecting okay. the, the And the border so patrol is also... Let me just say two things, and then let's talk about costs. Yeah. But so, I mean, I'm not yeah. going to dispute the numbers, yeah. but you certainly do still you know, meet ranchers in Arizona. Jeff Flake is very tied in. Senator Flake, you know, he sort of, he and McCain, they come to it with a constituency behind them, which is ranchers in Arizona who say, you know, my life is still not what it should be. You know, there's still people coming, there's still danger. There's still not just workers coming across my territory, but dangerous people. So I'm not disputing the improvement, but yeah. I don't think it's unreasonable to say, well, that's let's have some real measures. So we could do better. And, but that that we, we could do better. better. Let's have some, and let's yeah. have some real measures and some yeah. real triggers. But wait, 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 one thing. Immigration is gonna, immigration is way down now. It's in part due to better enforcement, but it's significantly due to that the economy has been in bad shape. As the economy improves, we're going to start to see people come across the border again, unless we have a legal way for them to come. And so the, the you know, the relative peace you describe is certainly going to have challenges. So it's not unreasonable to say, let's have some, if this is going to be a deal where there is a trigger, let's have it be a meaningful trigger. I mean, that was what was sort of insulting about the three sectors. Like, if it's going to be a trigger, at least have it be, a, if we're going to have a deal on this, let's have it be a meaningful deal. I agree, and now this is where we're getting to the part of the section where we, raise questions about our own side. I agree that if there are Republicans who say, try to set standards that are unmeetable, um, you know, 100%, never but anybody cross, no danger, never see a gun within 100 miles of the border. I mean, we can, you know, there are plenty of unmeetable things. You know, keep moving the goalposts so you can't get to a deal and it's unmeetable. That will be bad faith on our side. And I think there will be people who, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be some uh, the unreasonable asks in negotiations. Um, but to have meetable triggers, <coughs> <clears throat> Tough but meetable triggers is, is it seems to me a reasonable position. You, shifting gears a little bit, do you feel do you think that re, um, a Republican majority in the House is going to go along with having some pathway, however arduous or non arduous, to citizenship in its version of the legislation, or do you think one of the the defining kind of schisms at the end of the day going into conference is going to be legal status versus citizenship. Yeah, so I think that's the kind of $64,000 question about the future. And it's really hard to tell yet where the sort of center of gravity is among House Republicans. I hear a lot of people, basically every office I know and go to visit, people say we have to do something. And basically every, a lot of the offices I go and the center of gravity I think I start to see emerging is we're okay with legal status, but we are uncomfortable creating a special or direct path 
to citizenship. So we don't want to say that these people who came here, who broke, the first thing they did was break the law, that they get a reward, which is a special path created like just for them. Or, shortcut, gotcha, right. good phrase for it. But the, t the way people talk about it is a special path That's or a right. direct path. Um, now that people are not, you don't hear too many people saying they can never have citizenship. You have a lot of people saying there's other ways to get citizenship. We're not going to bar them from that. We're, we'd be okay with programs where they and other people, you know, what if they came through a guest worker program where they and everybody in the guest worker program had an option to get to citizenship, but a special path just for them that looks like a reward we're not comfortable with. Now, allegedly, that's what the Senate bill has in it, too. So, you know, there's, I think there should be room here to find a sweet spot. But it is possible, you know, it is, this is certainly going to be one of the more contentious issues and exactly where the majority of Republicans are. And I think, you know, the, 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 the famous, the term of art, you know, here is the Hastert rule, that no bill can pass without the majority of the majority. I don't see Republicans breaking the, ha you know, being willing to pass something that doesn't pass on the Hastert rule. So the question is going to be what can we get the majority of the majority, what can the political marketplace be? What can we get the majority of the majority to be for in this realm? And I don't think we quite know yet. And I don't think, um, I don't think, I think that's going to be something that's going to be emerging over the next few months and is going to be obviously one of the big question marks going forward, along with the cost, which is another and subject. And how have to high do you to. see health care on the list of, of Well, costs are going to be huge. And I mean, you, and so Simon had um, talked interestingly a few minutes ago about the cost. The Senate bill, as I understand it, a lot of the costs are, are, are to be paid Go by fees going forward. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big budgetary um, number, but the idea is that this is all, that this is, that the, you know, the financing of this is, and I don't exactly how the financing works, but that their fees will come in later and will come back to pay for stuff. Now, always complicated, and, you know, I, I, if, I, if I understood that stuff better, I'd make a lot more money <laughs> working in a, in a, you know, bank. Um, but, um, but it's, it's, I don't, it's not meant in the Senate bill to be a huge outlay. It's meant to be paid for as you go down the road by money coming in. I certainly think costs are going to come up as a big issue. Health care has already been the issue that kept the, um, the House. The Senate came to its health care answer. But in the House bipartisan group, they spent the last month arguing over what the health care, how, how this should mesh with Obamacare. And um, just barely came to an answer. And it's my understanding that the answer is so vague that you know, almost no one can tell you what it is. <laughs> and um, you know, so it is definitely going to be a subject. Costs are going to be subject of debate, I, I can almost guarantee. Simon, would, would you be willing to, and do you think um, a Democratic majority might be willing to accept that politically you have to exclude these 11 million uh, you know, legalized residents from the benefits of the subsidies that uh, people might be getting under the Affordable Care Act? I think it all depends on the deal. But uh, I think that, you know, the, the question is if Democrats keep feeling like they're being asked to give, 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 and if the House stuff gets dragged too far to the right. I mean, I think what was interesting in just since on Friday was the House, the Senate Democrats and the Gang of Eight saying no to this Cornyn Amendment. And I know that not everybody watching and in the room knows what the Cornyn Amendment was, but there was an amendment by Senator Cornyn, and he would be a good get uh, for, it would be better for John Cornyn to support this legislation right. than not. He had certain things that he wanted. There were actually big chunks of what he wanted that I think were actually very positive. Uh, you know, all the border infrastructure investment, given how much the border trade uh, has increased in recent years, there has to be much more done about this. That was a very thoughtful part of the bill. But the Senate Democrats said no because they felt that it was going to alter the structure of the deal. That the, you know, this is the whole. If I can use language and vocabulary, as we go to the floor over the next three weeks, there are going to be um, two types of amendments. There are going to be cosmetic amendments, ones that really don't alter the structure of the deal, the sort of magic deal, this finally wrought deal that was done. And then there are going to be things in there that will alter the structure of the deal. And those things are going to be, I think, resisted to a great degree by the Gang of Eight. They were during the, during the committee process. And they determined, the Democrats determined on Friday, despite Marco Rubio's involvement in this, and there's a little bit of annoyance at Rubio for the perception that he kind of went off and he went outside the Gang of Eight operating process, was that, um, that they said this thing was structural and it needed to be rejected. So the Cornyn Amendment is dead. Uh, he's apparently going to come back and try with Orrin Hatch, you know, to come back and salvage pieces of it and reintroduce it in smaller pieces. 
But that was a sign of the center holding, in, in my mind, and showing the resilience and, 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 frankly, the efficacy of this Gang of Eight, the integrity of this Gang of Eight process, which has really been kind of an amazing thing. But um, I think you're going to see um, some ver I don't think, I think right? the, the, the Corinne Amendment, I think, was dead on arrival. But yeah. I think there is going to be certainly a significant effort to toughen up the border triggers. On the House. Yeah. On the, no, even in the Senate side. Even in the Senate, even yeah. in the Senate side. And then I think there's going to be more, you know, considerably more movement mm -hmm. on a lot of things right. in the House. Right. Can I just address that really quickly? I think that the, when we say toughen up on the border, what's really, what that means for Republicans right now is um, moving up, at least what the Cornyn Amendment tried, was to move in that period where you went from legal to citizen to take some of the triggers that were at the end and move them much further up in the process, right? Sort of loading up the process was much more front-loaded than back-loaded. That's really what the Cornyn Amendment was. Well, the, the other concern is, again, who's signing off? Right. You know, is it, this, is it the person who's, is it the fox guarding the chicken coop? Is it the person whose job it is to make it secure also going to say that she's done a good job? Or is somebody else going right. to get to say she's done a good job? And if it's somebody else, right. who? But, I you know, I think we've talked a lot about the board. Yeah, I need to ask Simon about the same thing I asked you yeah, about sure. what, what are uh, things that might make you nervous, um, you know, when you, when you think, step back and, and try to be fair-minded about, you know, the desirability of, of getting legislation passed as opposed to keeping this kind of convenient political issue alive. Um, sure. What are, is what are your concerns about what some fellow Democrats might throw up as non-negotiables that sure. could derail comprehensive immigration? Reform? Sure. And, and let me just as a point, I, I, we were, I was groping for a third trigger and I couldn't remember and it's the entry exit visa. Right issue, right. which we're not going to get into the weeds on that because it's really yeah, nerdy. It's super thing. nerdy, but it's... I think we just need a plan on that one. <laughs> <laughs> a whole other segment on it. Look, I, here's what I would say. I, here's where I'm coming from on this, right, is that I, I have lived for the last decade, you know, part of my history is that in a previous legal incarnation of my organization, I ran the first set of ads ever by a center-left group in Spanish that was ever run in American political history. We did the first poll of Latino voters that was ever done by a center-left organization in political history. In 2004, we ran an ad campaign using what were called 527s then that went head-to-head -head with George Bush uh, in Spanish, and it was the first major national campaign conducted in Spanish by any center-left organization. So my organization has more paternity for the evangelizing around the Latino vote than any other group in the city, other than the Bush administration, frankly, who did a really good job, and that's why Democrats had to respond. And so I've been living the sort of the contentious battle over the rise of Latinos, right, as a, as a racial manifestation, right, as a societal demographic change manifestation. And what I think is so important about this bill is that not only will it, the Senate bill, give us a better immigration system, um, but it will also resolve the issue of the undocumented. It will be resolved. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the horrible racial rhetoric and language we've seen in the U.S., which to me is intolerable and really something that I can't personally accept and makes me upset, will be gone. And that the Jan Brewers and the, those who have demo- talking about what your side. No, 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 I'm going to get to it. No, no, but I mean, but I think this is, but so what I'm saying is that I think for that, there are a lot of things that we can accept okay. in the trade-off. So what I'm saying is that, if you're where you're coming so you, from. you want to see this get done. So what I'm saying is that I think the Democrats have already exhibited by allowing there to be triggers, which was a much bigger concession than anybody really understands. And to me, I still, when the bill came out, I was sort of flabbergasted by it because it meant that our side was really trying, frankly, to uh, accommodate what we believe are unreasonable and almost ridiculous uh, border objectives on, on by the Republicans. So I think that, first of all, I think that we're going to get a lot out of this that is really important to us. And if we got to stay focused on that, because I think some of these other things we can kind of compromise on. The second thing, though, I will say, and I'm going to make tomorrow happy by saying this, is that I, I do think that the low-skilled visa program, or what's being called the W visa program, is imperfect. And if there were ways to make it better, um, I think Democrats should be open to that. Um, because I think that the whole theory of the low-skilled visa system, to reiterate what she said, is we just don't want illegal workers in the country. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for them. It's bad for business. Businesses, I mean, so many businesses, by the way, that I've talked to are excited the idea that they're not going to have to worry about whether somebody they're hiring is, that they just don't know if they're illegal. They just right. don't know. They've got papers. They come in. The idea that this is going to get resolved 
oh my God, I mean, business, even though they'll put up with E-Verify, if it actually resolves the legal penalties and everything else for unknowingly hiring illegal workers, right? And so uh, I think that the low-skilled visa program, if it's too small and too restrictive and too narrow, will actually encourage more illegal immigration. Right. Uh, I may not be as sanguine or resolved to the idea that the flows are going to be what they used to be, because I think Mexico itself is changing. Mexico's producing more middle-class jobs. There was sort of a particular period in history post-NAFTA where Mexico had other demographic reasons to export excess labor, which I don't think are going to be replicated. And so I don't know that the flows will ever be the same. And we know, but, and we could debate this all day. So, is that, so is that, was, was yeah. characterizing this as kind of an AFL uh, imposed, uh, you know, on the one hand, cosmetically, yes, we're going to have a temporary worker visa program, but the numbers are so small so as to almost not be material. Well, I mean, what was amazing what, was, can I, can I, well, let me put it back. Is that, a, is that an accurate characterization? That is that I'll, something the that... The way that I'll characterize it is that in, in the original McCain-Kennedy bill, in order to ensure that we legalized the flow and restored circularity of labor in the United States, that we needed 550,000 visas a year to do that. The first year of the new is 20,000. I mean, you, can, you don't have you to do be math. really good at math yeah. to understand <laughs> right. that this is a significant break from where we were with, with uh, something that Ted Kennedy negotiated, right, in 2005. So I think there is, the Republicans have just, let me just anticipate where this is going. The Republicans in the House have made it really clear that they are going to alter this. The Democrats in the Senate have made it really clear that they're not going to accept any altering of the current uh, AFL chamber negotiation. I have a feeling that in the, in the trade-offs to come, this is an area where Democrats could give a little bit if we get something on the back end. And so, so you think it would be completely unreasonable for the Democrats not to revisit those numbers? What I said was that in a, in a reasonable <laughs> negotiation that will be taking place over the next five or six months, that if there are things that we can get that are important, this might be one of the things that, are, that can be improved. And, and I know just you to talk for a second about the right. numbers, I mean, this is really important. It's important not just for the businesses, but it's important for America, because if what we're trying to do here is deal with undocumented immigration, unauthorized immigration. We have to deal with past unauthorized immigration, but you want to prevent the 11 million. future. You want yeah. to prevent future. You know, why would we do all this in order to, to, to not fix the problem and be back here in, in 10 or 15 or 20 years facing it again? Surely we want to prevent future illegal immigration as much as we want to prevent past. And preventing it involves three things. It involves better work control on the border, workplace verification and punishment of the bad Apple employers. But the most important thing you need is a way for the workers we actually need to come legally. You know, if you think of it as kind of water, and human beings are not water, but if you think of it as kind of water running in a dusty ground, you want to put it in a pipeline. The pipeline has to be big enough to take the water, otherwise you're going to still have water in the dusty ground. Um, on the numbers, it's true that Mexico is changing, becoming more middle class, smaller families, but America's work needs are not going to change that that much. Right. You know, what, what, what draws this flow, it's a push and a pull, the American workforce, in 1950, half of the people in the workforce were high school dropouts who wanted to do unskilled work. Today, less than 5% of the people in the workforce are high school dropouts who want to do unskilled work. We don't need as many, but it's like a swimming pool has shrunk to a Dixie cup. People still need you some workers. Water <laughs> she, she's been doing but, this for a long time. But, but, it's very but, Southwest. But, <laughs> but um, the, so the point is, you know, that program, it, it's not that the absolute, you, you can change it without changing the absolute numbers. You just have to make it more sensitive. I mean, numbers is one way to change it, but more sensitive to employers' real needs, not as a sock to business. The number time. should be adjusted. Right. The number should go up in good economic times when we really need the workers, and it should go down in bad economic times when more right. Americans are looking for right. work. And employers should have to try to hire Americans first, I, no question. I want to add one quick thing to that is that, you know, I, I didn't really come to the position I'm about to state until very recently, which is that I, I did, we need a lot more immigrants in the country than we have now. I mean, I, we're going to get a lot more if we passes. Well, 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 we we aren't going to get that many more. I think I think we have to be careful. I mean, because this is a negotiating thing with the Republicans. The House Republicans have also taken a position, at least they verbally stated it, no new net visas, right? Which is not, re which is something that has sort of dropped out of the debate, and we don't really know where they're going to end up on that, and that becomes a very consequential position that could end up, again, killing the bill. This, this uh, bill is going to increase. This, this is going to increase, but I don't want to overly dra dramatize, particularly because the W visa has been shrunk so much. 
that the actual, I mean, there, this is one area, can I just, let me just spend a 30 seconds on this. This is a part of the debate that I think has been grossly exaggerated by the opponents of the bill, which is this notion there are millions and millions of people coming in and everything else, right? I mean, that the system is out of control and millions of people are pouring over the border, border and the immigration, you know, is that, look, we, we, for the size of our economy and the size of our country now, which has increased dramatically since many of these numerical targets were set 20, 30, 40 years ago, is that you know we're allowing in legally each year you know a million people give or take right I mean you can sort of carve it up different ways the economy needs more than that and so what we're doing is we're still I think at the end of this one of the things that may keep tomorrow in business you know, beyond to beyond the immigration bill is that I'm not personally convinced that the way that we're dealing with the legal immigration system is really I at its core dealing with where the 21st century American yeah. economy is. And I think there's going to be an area, I think there's going to be opportunities to improve that as we go through this process of reform and learning about workflows and where the American economy yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, here's where I'll, um, I'll go a little off the reservation. I mean, I think, um, I think there's not enough discussion of that, to be honest. Yeah. I think the discussion is about the unauthorized and about the border. And there's not enough discussion about, about the, what the, what the right. really what yeah. America needs for yeah. the 21st right. century. Yeah. And I think there's, um, you know, obviously, we, and we haven't talked even here about the high-skilled. You know, the high-skilled is a critically important piece of this bill. Um, you know, in the 19th century, countries competed for coal and iron ore and colonies. Now they compete for the smart immigrants, for smart people who, you know, brain power who can come help your com com company innovate. And if we're not friendly to them and make it easy and make the visa streamlined and remove some of the uncertainty, we're really going to be at an economic disadvantage. And the bill attempts to address that and attempts to, it really there's a whole new fangled system for how we decide what, how we give out green cards that almost doesn't get discussed. I mean, right. the, the, the merit-based system, you know, uh, how many people even know what it is? And, and there's not probably, for all the, you know, the deal making has been pretty good here and we're going to go on having a lot of this horse trading and deal making. There's some parts of this that, that you know, aren't getting, aren't getting considered, yeah. arguably enough. And, okay. I, and I think we're going to have a better legal immigration system, but I still think there are going to be opportunities to make it better still in the next five to ten so years. So what are the chances from one to ten that we're going to pass comprehensive immigration reform this And year? signed into law? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think very one high high ten. single digits. Uh, Give me know. a number. No, I think it's eight or nine. I think eight it's or nine. Okay, so can I tell a joke first before I answer? <laughs> so <laughs> so there's, a, there's a Republican member of the House who's been very engaged in this, who has a little riff he does. I'm just stealing it wholesale because it's so good. He says, I've never seen the chances better. This is one of the guys trying to write the bill in the House. I've never seen the chances better. The president sees it as his legacy, and Republicans see it as their future, and the chamber and the AFL agree, and Microsoft and Intel are for it. I've never seen the chances better. He pauses. I'll give it 5%. <laughs> Um, I'm on the <laughs> optimistic side of 50-50. So I don't six. Yeah, six and All right. a half. We haven't we haven't talked about why the public doesn't seem to be that engaged and whether that's good or bad. But I have I was I wanted to get into that and I have about a dozen other questions. But looking at the clock, I'm eager to get your participation. So let's take some uh, questions, comments. This is being streamed. So wait for a microphone. And, uh, and identify yourself, please, sir. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Brad Botwin. I run a group called Help Save Maryland. And uh, I came today. Uh, I really uh, needed to get uh, re-energized. Um, fortunately, I didn't have lunch before I uh, came <laughs> over. Uh, some of these uh, Cheshire Cat smiles uh, about, oh, my God, we're going to have E-Verify in place. Well, when you make everyone legal on day one, you may as well just throw E-Verify out the window. You don't need it. Uh, we're going to spend another $5 billion. In Maryland, we spend close to $2 billion a year for education, incarceration, and other expenses for the 300,000 plus illegals we have. Uh, crime on the border, low? Sure, <laughs> because it's up here in Baltimore and in Chicago and in other places where the illegal immigrants have moved to. They're too smart to stay right at the border. Uh, I, I mean, I could just go on and on. Internal uh, security measures here have been gutted by the administration. Uh, 287G is no longer even on the ICE website. Secure communities is not being enforced, and there are many communities just waving in the face, you know, they're, they're thumbing their nose at, at ICE. Come and get them if you want them. Um, I was at a protest Friday. The district's trying to give driver's licenses to illegal immigrants. Uh, 
saying, you know, who cares about real ID for driver's licenses, come and get us. So this whole thing is really a joke. What is happening, and this is a new dynamic since 2007, is that on uh, July 15th, the Black American Leadership Alliance is leading a very large protest from Freedom Plaza all the way down to the Capitol. So now we have black Americans who have double-digit unemployment, and when they hear Simon say, oh my God, we need more immigrants? We don't need more immigrants. We need jobs for Americans right now. And this is gonna be a historic march, and there'll be other groups supporting it. Um, I think this is gonna crash and burn, as it okay. should. Thank you for that perspective. Um, let, let's take another comment. Yeah. Let's take a couple of comments yeah. and then and questions if you have some, but appreciate that perspective. I'm in the back. Good afternoon. Peter Boyce, Community Affairs Consultant. Panel, isn't it true that this bipartisan group came together as a result of the demographics to the last presidential election, one, and two. Given this, is this bill alive on Simon, or is it dead? Simon, you're first, please. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Um, let's take another question. Uh, I know that gentleman. Almost wrapping them together. Please uh, identify yourself. I know you, but I'm the I'm Fuzz with the New America Foundation. So we have a do something posture, right? But is the but the most that the House can do? Let's imagine it's here, right? What their do something is to you know reclaim some part of the Latino what they lost. But is is that enough to reclaim the Latino? Are Latinos going to go for the most that Republicans can do? Is that gap irreducible? Why don't we take some of these now? Yeah, um, sure. So is this all? Is this all because yeah. of the election? So, um, I think the election um, woke a lot of Republicans up. No question. Um, I think you know there's some Republicans who um, they're thoughtful Republicans who know the system is broken and want to fix the system. And you know, as, as Marco Rubio likes to say, we have de facto amnesty right now. We've got to do something about it. So I don't, you know, to, it's not just pandering. There are a lot of people who've known for a long time that the system is broken. It doesn't work, okay. even if your values are conservative. It doesn't really work for you. There's no question that the that the election is what triggered it and focused everybody's minds. But to say, you know, I don't think it's only uh, pandering. Will it work? as pandering, so to speak, <laughs> uh, if it were pandering. Um, you know, I think the problem is with Republicans that they, the way, it's not, it's immigration reform has become a kind of a stand-in litmus test issue for many Latino voters. Many Latino voters are skeptical about do we need more immigrants and some of those questions that we talked about. But they've come to, to equate how elected officials talk about immigration as really a, a, a substitute or proxy for how those elected officials feel about them. You know, the famous ads in California were ads where the, run by the Republicans were where they said they keep coming and they showed people running across the border. And, you know, third and fourth generation people saw this on TV and they said, who's they? You know, who are you talking about? And, you know, what do you feel about us? And, I, and you know, when Romney, I think, you know, and, and, and again, I am a Republican and Romney was my candidate, but the problem with the way Romney campaigned is a lot of Latinos heard it as saying, you know, we don't like you. We want you to self-deport. And, um, you know, my analogy for that, it's like an encyclopedia salesman who comes to your door and says, I'm trying to sell you encyclopedias, but, you know, I don't really like people like you. And the point is this, um, this you know, assuming we pass this bill and Republicans play a, are equal partners and play a robust part, um, I don't think that's going to, even if, even if they, they get everything they want, I don't think it's going to immediately make Latinos say, oh, yeah, now we're Republicans. But it's going to take that bad, we hope, the idea is it's going to take those, there are enemies and they don't like people like us, start to take some of that off the table so that Republicans can talk to Latinos about other things where, they, where Latinos might be interested in, so to speak, what they have to sell. And, you know, so whether it's about small businesses or about education, education and social mobility and conservative values. Um, you know, President Reagan used to say, um, Latinos are Republicans, they just don't know it. Now maybe that is, you know, find some argument about that around the country. But I think there are a lot of things that, that Republicans believe in that could be appealing to Latinos that they can't hear because they think we're the enemy on immigration. You know, and so whether or not it's exact, if it's legal status, 
with a no special path to citizenship, you know, is is that going to is that going to be enough to level the playing field? You know, I think it depends how more depends on the tenor of the debate and sort of who looks like they're leaning in and who looks like they're trying to solve it and what happens next. You know, this is not just about Republicans. This is this is in a way not so much about Republicans coming alive to the reality of the guy who's washing your dishes in the back of the restaurant, as it is to Republicans coming alive to the reality of the Latino voters in their district, who are you know, increasingly um, blue collar and middle class people who are you know, on campuses and in state legislatures and in, 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 involved in our communities. You know, they, and they're in the room. It's just that Republicans haven't been really talking to them. I think this is an awakening to them. And it's going to, a lot's going to depend on how Republicans handle that going forward is going to be as important as exactly what provisions are in the bill. And I think you were asked if the bill is dead or alive. And three, th three things. Bill is very much alive. Um, you know, again, uh, what was to me the the most important sign is that after the Boston, the terrible tragedy and uh, the Boston bombing, the Gang of Eight and even guys like Paul Ryan stood together and said this shouldn't really affect the debate we're having around immigration, and that was sort of an early, an important test. And I think the Gang of Eight group continues to prevail. Just on the other two things quickly, I, I won't spend too long, one is that I do think the question that was asked by your colleague is really in some ways the important one. I, my own view is that there is no bill that Democrats can support that will pass with the Hastert rule in the House, period. I just don't think it's possible. I think the idea that we're holding that out, she, you know, Tamara has to say this. I mean, it's part of her job because she works inside the Republican Party. It's not possible given where they are, is, I mean, given that the good lad is introducing a bill to give body armor and guns to ICE agents this week, and they're going to be debating that this week, I, I just think going from there. And remember, the last time the House voted on immigration reform in 2005, um, the House Republicans voted to deport 11 million people and felonize them. It wasn't self-deport. It was actual deportation and funding for it. So the House Republican party, although I just want to say, I, th I, think the, I think the Republican Party is trying really hard. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want in any way be critical uh, of it. I think, I think the Republicans in the House and the Senate, as Tamar said, have sort of woken up and gotten the memo that they got to try a little bit harder here. And I think they really are trying. But there's just a limit to how far ideologically any politician can travel in such a short period of time without sounding like they lied to their constituents for 20 years. I, I think and even so if Boehner said, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice my career and ignore the Hastert rule, I don't think, um, you know, then which, you know, profile and courage of the major kind, ultimate sacrifice or whatever for a politician, I don't think that the, that the, the rank and file Republicans would stand for Well, we'll for see. It. We'll see. I mean, this yeah. is what we don't know. I mean, yeah, we just right. don't yet, and a lot of it will depend, and I think it's things like, how effective are the arguments? How does this debate fall out? I think the Democrats have done, as I said earlier, a bad job at really trying to win this argument about the border, um, which I think would have weakened the Republican resolve on some of these border issues. We just didn't lean into this issue. But on the, on the final point, the one, the one statistic that I just want to point out, and there was a lot put on the table here by, by the gentleman in the, in the front row, is that you know the one thing I always go back to about the, the role of, of the undocumented in the Latino community is that you know, the, the community in the United States that has the higher, highest worker participation rate, the people who work more than any other demographic group in the country are Latino immigrants, right? Uh, if you're an undocumented, there are no, you can't get welfare, you, the, the social, yes, you can go to school as required by the Supreme Court. Yes, you have to be treated in an emergency room as any civil society would do if somebody came in who was sick, right? But this sort of general aspersion that the undocumented community is more law is more law breaking than the general public, not true. They actually work more than the uh, than the overall public. And so these ideas that somehow this vast pool of undocumented has left the border region, which would be surprising to hear from the people who live on the border, by the way, and have moved into places like Baltimore and are committing crimes, is, you know, we would call that, if I could say it wasn't on TV, bull whatever, right? And and it is and it's just not fact-based, and it's sad to me that there are people making, you know, making assertions like this that are so easily refutable and untrue, and that really reflect the incredible race, racial bias, I think, but, that's but, driving this debate. But, and I, and the, reason that I'm, the reason that I'm raising this is that there's nothing he said that was based in fact. And, and, that in, and so, I mean, for example, worker participation rates, right? Crime rates. I mean, you can go look at all this stuff, right? Latino immigrants don't commit crimes at higher levels than the rest of the population. That's just not 
true. And so what we have to do, I think, in order for the country to work through this, right, this is a hard issue, right? We're going through profound demographic change in a very rapid uh, way. We're seeing how Europe, through their migration, is tearing themselves up, right? That's not happening here. But and, and, so, yeah, and so I'm just going to conclude by saying that I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do our best, to be fact-based. I sat here with all sorts of statistics during this entire discussion today, trying to keep the civil and fact-based. And I think it's incumbent upon everyone in this debate to do the same. But this to, is hard. to be fair, Simon, the, the gentleman from Maryland did, yeah. he also mentioned, and, and this is true, yep. that we're living in a time of relatively high unemployment across the country. Um, and he referenced the uh, even higher uh, unemployment rate among African Americans. Uh, he referenced uh, the fact that local and state governments do absorb a lot of the costs um, that the undocumented population um, uh, bring. Uh, you know, it, in some ways, some people have analogized our current immigration system to sort of unfunded mandates. There might be aggregate benefits to the U.S. economy, right. but some of these costs are, you know, that are borne by, um, you know, county hospitals because of the ER rooms and, and you know, and, and education systems at the local level, they're not seeing, they're not, you know, th they're not being compensated for. Now, if you had legalization, of arguably, course, but of course they, they would are, be. But, but let me just say, yeah. that, the, the perspective uh, that he presented, uh, you know, at the end of the day was kind of where the center of gr political gravity was the last time we tried to do this, this reform in 2006, 2007. Um, you had bipartisan support here in Washington for it. You know, you had the establishment, you know, corporate, you had labor, everybody was lined up to do this and it seemed like we were going to do it. But the perspective that he injected into this discussion turned out to be a pretty prevalent or at least, you know, a, a quite a uh, heartfelt perspective around the country right. in the in the since then we've had Can an I economic crisis yeah. so yeah. how do why do we feel like that sentiment isn't going to so, carry so, the day again so yeah can i say something about that? i mean a i think the polling shows that the public is even in 06 and 07 it was actually kind of a polling showed when you dug deep that it was a, a small minority that was adamantly against the bill it was every poll you know i saw we, I saw a dozen polls and you saw a different dozen polls showed that adamant majority, that adamant minority to be in the 15 to 20 percent. There's another adamant minority on the other side that's totally for it. Most of the public sort of 60 percent is kind of in between as they are in many, many issues. And if that day they saw on the news, you know, a drunk uh, DUI, illegal immigrant, you know, was in an accident, they'd be against it. And that day if they had just, you know, redone their house and the, and the guy did a good job, the drywaller, right. they'd be for it. And so the public is very movable. The 20% the the on the very anti side dominated the debate. And the big question this time is going to be where is the, that middle 60%? And polling shows that they see immigration as much less of a kind of make or break, do or die issue. Those numbers, I don't have them in my head, but it's way, way down. It's like from 70% to 40% or something like that. And you know, I'm waiting to see in this next couple of weeks, the public hasn't really been paying attention yet. This has been sort of in the newspaper articles that we've been reading, but you know, not kind of leading the nightly news. Is it ever going to get to the point that the pub so much of the public is paying attention that it does lead the nightly news? I'm not sure. And when it does, what I kind of wonder is, and it'll probably be somewhere in between this, but is the public going to sort of shrug and say, yeah, it's time to do that? Um, which is actually what they did when the president introduced his initiative for young people brought here as a mi illegally as minors. The public kind of shrugged. Even nice Republicans, even Republicans, kind of said it's about time to do that. We got to deal with that. Is there, are they going to shrug or are they going to, you know, roar? And I'm kind of predicting it's going to be more on the shrug side. Uh, we'll see. But I just want to say one thing about the unemployment, and you know, we could argue all day about the economics yeah, yeah. of immigration. But let me just get, throw out one little set of numbers. We just did a study where we looked in particular, we used government numbers to look at the difference between the jobs Americans do and the jobs immigrants do. And one of the little things we looked at, we looked at three occupations, um, made in a hotel resort, a dishwasher, and I'm going to forget what the other, oh, a landscape guy. And we looked at the percentage of people who've been unemployed in the last five years who've actually taken those jobs. Those are really hard, physically intensive jobs. And the percentages are under 10% in every case. So even unemployed Americans mm -hmm. don't want those jobs. I want to take a couple more. Do we have more questions, comments? Yes, sir. Thank you. 
My name is Sam Spahn, part of the McCain Institute. I'm originally from Indianapolis, but I'm currently in school in Austin, Texas, the University of Texas. So the immigration debate is obviously very big there. Uh, but what, how do you think the president has played out on this? He seems to be unusually quiet on this issue, and at least the media tells us so. Uh, do you think it's a politically smart move, or should he get more involved in this debate? Is he leading from behind, Simon? Do let's we take a few questions. Do we take that? Uh, let's yeah. take it, because I think it's helpful. A couple more. Hi, I'm Jose Diaz with Mundo Fox. Just a quick question about the politics for Senator Corning on this. He doesn't seem to get the love from those people opposing the bill. And also from the Democratic side, what's, what's his logic? <laughs> you get to answer that. Yeah, I will. Is there any, any more? Why don't, we, why don't we take those? So President and Senator Corning. I, I, I do want to say that even though I don't agree with Senator Corning, um, it's important now that he's involved in the debate and is, uh, you know, he's an important senator and he represents a state that's got a lot at stake in the immigration bill. And I think it's much better now that he's actively and aggressively pursuing some, you know, public objectives than sitting on the sidelines. And so I think in that sense, this is um, helpful. And as I said earlier, there are, in the Cornyn Amendment, there's a series of things that he's proposing about border infrastructure investment that I think are hugely critical to both the U.S. and Mexican economies that I hope get adopted even if his amendment doesn't. And, and so I, I'm not, I don't, I don't believe, I'm not personally characterizing Senator Cornyn's involvement so far in this in the way the New York Times did on Sunday that, that called his amendment toxic. I thought that was a gross overstatement of the role that he's trying to play. We need him in the tent, and hopefully we can work something out with him in the next couple of weeks. Um, but his amendment is dead, and we'll see, see what happens. Look, on the president, I, I, you know, I think that the, clearly the White House has made a decision to um, allow the Senate to lead. Reasonable, reasonable decision, right? It was going well. They've hung together. They're doing a good job. They produced a good bill, right? What has perhaps been lacking, and, and I think the second calculation was all the reports from the Republicans that the more this felt like Obama's bill, the more that it would raise the ire of opponents of Obama, of which there are many in the country. And the more that it seemed like a bill that came out of Congress with a lot of Republican support, that it would just be easier to sell to the 60% that Tamar referenced in, in the middle. I think what's the cost of that, however, has been the defining of the issue to the public. I mean, to your point that was just raised that we're going to have a debate for the next three weeks. I'm not sure we've had a Senate floor debate on a meaningful issue in the country that's going to be this sort of spirited and this civil and this organized in a long time. And I think it's in that sense, this is going to be a very good exercise in democracy we're about to see. Whether or not the American public pays any attention to anything that happens in the Senate is something we're going to find out also, I think, because there's just general, you know, sort of uh, unhappiness with Congress in Washington. But um, I don't know what messages come out. There's going to be a lot of horse trading and wangling and weird amendments and everything else. But I do hope that this floor debate will bring the American people in, because I think it would be better if this ends up passing, which I think it will. It would be better if the public was integrally involved in the consideration and thinking about it and coming to their own conclusions of support or against. And I don't know that we've done that yet, and I, and I hopefully that will happen uh, in, in the floor debate. I just want to say one thing about polling, and then I'll be done because I didn't answer that question, is that let's just be clear that in virtually every poll taken on immigration reform since 2005, there's been 55, 60 percent plus support for what we call comprehensive immigration reform. MSNBC, NBC Wall Street Journal last week in their poll, when you demonstrated a, a second truism, which is when you define specifically that the path to citizenship will include back of the line, pay a fine, you know, conditions, the support in the NBC Wall Street Journal poll went up to 76 percent, right, in, in the public. There is broad bipartisan support for this bill uh, in the country, and there has been for eight years. What there has been is a very effective opposition. And frankly, the advocates have not been uh, nearly as spirited and as engaged as the opposition. I think that's changed. And I think that's why we're going we're gonna to win this time. So uh, the president, I think from the Republican point of view, 
it's, 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 thank goodness he's left it to the Senate, right? I mean, I think the um, president is viewed as a very polarizing figure um, among Republicans, and um, the, it's, it's been, it's, if the president had been more engaged from the beginning, I don't think we'd be where we are. And I think it's, um, it's very, he's at the beginning there were some of us who were concerned he wouldn't exercise so much restraint, but um, thank goodness he has. Um, you know, there are people, again, went to the, you know, when I have my, my, my cynical, scary, um, you know, bad nightmare fantasies, it's that the president has a you know, good angel on one shoulder and a bad angel on the other, and the bad angel uh, is our folks in the party who say, you know, um, let, let, let's make this a partisan issue. You know, let's make this something that the D's win and that only with the D's are doing with a handful of Republicans. And you know, I hope that, that the, the president doesn't have that angel. Um, I hope, you know, I'm wrong about my cynicism, but I'm, I'm you know, I hope that, I hope that the self-restraint that we've seen and the willingness to let the bipartisan process work its will will continue. Um, about Cornyn, um, you know, what's been really interesting, I'm not gonna try to, um, to get in, to channel John Cornyn because I certainly can't do that. But I think it's been very interesting to see um, how all the Republicans, many Republicans, right, in the um, even who do not support the bill. I mean, if you watch the Judiciary Committee markup, Senator Lee, Senator um, Cruz, um, we'll put you know we won't put them all in the same camp because they have different positions. But even Republicans who, in the end, are not going to end up voting for the bill, um, have tried to be sensitive to thinking about being part of the solution. You know, what can we do to fix the immigration system? I mean, um, and, and isn't legal immigration a good idea? I mean, Senator Cruz, who you know, no one thinks is gonna come anywhere near voting for this bill, his amendment in the Judiciary Committee was to add a million green cards, right? To say we need more immigrants, we need legal immigration, the immigration is a good thing. I'm not prepared to legalize the people who've broken the law, but I'm for legal immigration. That as much as the vote counts we're gonna see on the, on the bill are evidence of the sea change that's going on in the Republican Party about Latino no voters. And again, you know, you can read that cynically. You can say, oh, they just want their votes. Or you can say, they're listening to them. And, you know, I think what you're seeing is people starting to listen to their constituents and say, what can we do? And, you know, somebody like John Cornyn is a, is a you know, has, has, has always, his, his role in life and his platform is about law and order. You know, and that's not going to change. And he's trying to reconcile his listening to Latino voters and what the Latino voters need and how do we fix the immigration system with his, you know, very, his, his prosecutor's concern about the law. And he's got his ideas about that, you know, whatever you think of them. Um, you know, and I think the amendment is with some, some combination of those things, and as Simon's pointing out very helpfully, this concern about fixing the border infrastructure so that it works. And you know, it all, it's no accident that going forward, Texas is going to be the state where, the, where, where, where Latino demographics are going to make the most difference um, you know, in the next decade. Um, you know, Latino, te Texas has been a pretty solidly red state for quite a while. Um, you know, that will not always be true if the Latino vote uh, comes of age in Texas and Republicans haven't um, start to win more more hearts. Do you have one more? Yeah, just one last. Very quickly, I very think quick, we're up against I think this question that Tamar has raised about whether there is this thought in Democrats' head that, you know, this thing could fail and we'd still benefit and we'd keep the status quo. I, I gotta tell you, I've never heard anybody say that this time around, right? It may have been whispered before. I, I think that, you know, I was in a, a briefing this morning with someone from Univision who was showing clips of the, how the network is prospering and one of the the core of the whole thing was Jose, I mean, Jorge Ramos confronting Obama over him not keeping his promise. And, and I think that about fixing the immigration system, and I think what, I think that what Democrats are motivated by is this sense of obligation. We've said we were gonna do this. We've said we we're gonna do this for a long time. We gotta keep our word here, right? We gotta get this done. This is a real thing that's gonna materially affect an awful lot of people and also give us a better immigration system. So I don't think Democrats, I think the political, the politics of this have been settled. Republicans have lost the politics of this. Um, they misplayed this issue terribly over a long period of time. They've been terribly damaged by it. What they need to do now, as Tamar said, is to have any chance. This is, this is a suing for peace strategy now. This is not about creating prosperity with a Latino electorate. This is about getting Latinos, particularly younger ones, to open up to their party again, to give them a chance to make the case on the rest of this stuff, I don't think they're going to get a lot of material benefit as a party if this passes. I think a lot of it's going to accrue to the Democrats, but it's going to put them back in the game and give them a chance to rebuild their standing 
in, a, in with Latinos over the next decade in ways that, frankly, they've done well before. I mean, this is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. George Bush was expert at winning the Latino vote. This is not really something that should be so hard for them. So, you know, the politics in this, Democrats really want to get this done and feel I, obligated. I hope you're right. Yeah, we're going to find out. Okay. <laughs> well, we have some interesting weeks and months ahead of us. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing sure. your, your perspectives and wisdom. Thank you all for coming. And uh, let's do this again later in the year. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and I appreciate you. Uh, I don't know, take <laughs> and I'm sorry.